always reminding myself to wait for that little, you know, little story of Jesus logo. It's so dramatic. It's so exciting. I, I, you saw the video from last time, the all-time best book. Let me just say again, I, as a pastor, some of the best things I've seen God do in people's lives is in the context of community. So if you've been coming for a while and you don't feel connected, now is the perfect time for you to get involved in that. We want to help you do that if you're interested. So please see us at the kiosk before you leave today if you want to find a way that you can get involved reading that word in community. Uh, as you know, or if you don't know, we are in a, a year-long theme uh, called the story of Jesus. Very excited about this as a church family to dive into his life and its significance for us. Let me begin by asking you a bit of an odd question. Um, what if I told you that tomorrow at noon, I wanted you to meet me in downtown Lake Geneva? What would you think? If I just said, listen, uh, tomorrow at noon, be there at, 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 at noon sharp, downtown Lake Geneva, what would you say? What would you say? My guess is, some of you might say, sure. <laughs> I wonder, you're a very trusting person. I'm guessing most of you, or if not many of you, would say, why? Right? Why do you want me to be there? I mean, if I'm going to take off work and drive an hour and a half both ways, get a sitter for my kids, or, or if I'm going to make that effort, okay, Pastor Jeff, I, you know, but is, what's the reason, what's the purpose for this meeting, and why does it have to be in Lake Geneva? How many of you at least have that thought, right? How many of you would blindly drive to Lake Geneva at noon? Good for you. See me afterwards. No, right? Those are valid questions. What if I gave you no more information than that? What if I didn't tell you why? Didn't tell you why I wanted to meet with you, what I wanted to, wanted to discuss, who else is going to be there, or why I had to let Geneva? Gave you no more information. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that more than half of you wouldn't show. Because it's, it's a lot to ask, right? Without any reason or information or purpose for that sort of meeting, there's got to be a reason, a justification. But what if I ask you this? What's the reason? What's the justification? What's the why for you getting up every day? You ever stop and ask yourself that? Listen, I'm not driving an hour and a half to Lake Geneva unless I know what we're meeting about. I have a busy life. I don't have time for that unless I understand why we need to meet there. Why are you getting up in the morning? What's the reason, purpose, justification? What's the why for your life? Your work. Your marriage, your everyday activities, why do you do those things? Why do you sacrifice that time? Why do you put that effort in? Is there a driving purpose behind it all? Or do you sometimes feel like you just do stuff? You just get up and do. It's what we do. I have to live life. I have to pay bills. I, I don't know. I don't think about why. I don't have time. I just go and do what I have to do. There are so many people inside and outside of the church that have no reason or answer for that question for their life. Why? That question really is what's behind the whole series, the story of Jesus. In a nutshell, he's the why. He's the reason. He's the purpose and justification. And the whole year is to study and understand that in deeper ways than we ever had before. And apply it to our lives in ways we never thought of before. That's the question. How many of you know your Greek mythology? You like Greek mythology? I, I used to love the Greek mythologies when I was a kid, and we read them in school, but maybe you forgot most of them. Do you remember the Greek myth of Sisyphus? Hard to say. Sisyphus? Who knows? Remember King Sisyphus? Remember what he was famous for? He uh, sort of, um, he gave away, I know that Jeff Lovell knows, he gave away some of the secrets of the gods, and he was deceitful, and he got on the bad side of the Greek gods, and so, long story short, there's different versions of this, but Zeus condemned him to a very particular kind of eternal punishment. It was to roll a massive boulder up a hill every day. It took all day to get it there, and then at, at sunset every day, that boulder rolled back down, and he had to start all over again the next day. He was compelled to roll this boulder up the hill every day, knowing it was going to roll back down after that exhausting effort every night, and every day the same thing. A pointless act from which nothing ever comes except the need to do it all over again. You ever feel like your life is like that? I know people who live their life like that. French philosopher Albert Camus, who was the opposite of an evangelical Christian, if you will, wrote about this myth. It's saying it's a metaphor for the modern man, modern person's existence. He called it absurdism, almost a philosophical school of thought. And the only way to face life and live a good life was to acknowledge it's all absurd. It's all meaningless. So let's just face that fact and get on with it. P. 
people try to deal with or avoid this issue in all manner of ways. But what if, what is the Christian response to what can feel like just this meaningless existence? A whole bunch of stuff that you worry about. And then you wonder why. What's the great why behind it all for the, the Christ follower? We're going to look at first, the very first ch- verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. So it shouldn't be hard to find. All the way to the left in your Bibles if you have them. Or you can follow on the screens. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Doesn't sound like much of a purpose statement. But let's hold that in our minds for a minute. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now flip over, if you will, to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now keep in mind, the Bible is not like a compendium of stories. I think sometimes in Sunday school we make this mistake, or some of you perhaps grew up in traditions where it's like random disconnected stories where strange things head, a donkey talks, an axe head floats, the Red Sea parts. I don't know how it all fits together, but it's interesting reading at times, right? It's not like, a, um, a, like Aesop's fables for Christians, right? It's not a collection of weird stories that have religious morals in them. That's not the Bible. The Bible is one unified, cohesive story. And if it was a collection of stories that had morals, it would be essentially about you, what you have to do. But it's not. It's a story about who God is. And that's, that's like lesson one, in case you're wondering, if you leave here with nothing else tonight. The Bible is not primarily about you. If you grew up in a family where you were the center of, your, of the uni- your parents' universe, I'm sorry about that. They didn't do you any favors, right? You're not the center of the universe, and you're not the center of the story. Now, it has implications for your life. You're in here, but it's not about you. It's about God. It's, so it's not about you and what you have to do. It's about who God is and what he has done on your behalf. And right here in the very first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, we see, in the beginning, God In other words, when the world began, when things came into existence, God was already there. That's very significant. Don't skip over that. Before anything came to be, God was. He's the only thing, object, being that had no beginning. Because in the beginning, our beginning, all of its beginning, he was already there. He is the eternal word. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, because God has no beginning, everything that exists is grounded in Him. All things have their origins in Him. Because He's not only the eternal Word, He's also the creating Word. Let's read on in the story. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. This will be familiar to most of us. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. John then, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, since we're paralleling these texts. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness And the darkness has not overcome it. So right in the beginning, we see this parallel between God creating and the Word being present, the Word being God, and God separating light and dark, and the parallel in John of light and dark, and the light penetrating the darkness. He made all things. So nothing exists that he did not bring into being. He's the creator, author, originator of all that is. Let me make it plain for you. That includes you. He's the creator, author, designer, planner of all that exists, and that includes you. If you're having trouble drawing the implications, that means he has rightful claim over your life. You belong to him, whether you'd like to admit that or not. Let me contrast this with what might be considered the secular view. Um, Put, I think, succinctly by uh, an atheist philosopher and novelist, Bertrand Russell. Anybody heard of Bertrand Russell before? Perhaps you studied him in school. Uh, Not a believer, certainly. And this is his, 
he sums up in uh, philosopher's terms what I think a lot of people in the secular world go through thinking this is how it is. Man is the product of causes that had no prevision of the end they were achieving. You and I are products of causes that had no thought for the end that they were achieving, he says. All our hopes and fears, loves and beliefs are but the accidental collocations of atoms. All the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. It's a cheerful thought. And the whole temple of human achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. I wonder if Bertrand Russell struggled with depression. He wrote that in an essay called A Free Man's Worship. His point is, you're the product of causes that had no thought about you. It's accidental, collocation of atoms. And all the stuff we base our existence on, we think is significant, is all going to crumble and burn up at the end anyway. It's all meaningless. The sooner you face that fact, the sooner you can get on with whatever kind of meaning of a life you want to create. Religion, then, is just our way of dealing with, with this very hard truth, he says. Made up stories to help us avoid the fact that it's all meaningless. Contrast that with what we read in Genesis 1 and John 1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. The Word was God. The Word was with God in the very beginning. Nothing was made. Nothing came into being that he didn't speak into existence by his Word. Now, in order to grasp the implications of Genesis 1, I want to turn again to John 1. John uses, you'll notice, this very interesting uh, word or phrase to communicate the significance of what's going on here. He says, in, the be- not, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created. In John 1, what do we have? In the beginning was the Word. The Greek word for word, don't, be, don't get too confused, is the Greek word, anybody know? Logos or logos. We get our English word logic from this word. It's not like logic like you're thinking of. Uh, Logos is a very, John knew exactly what he was doing when he wrote this. Matthew wrote to a primarily Jewish audience. Luke wrote to give a a detailed historical account. Mark wrote the very, like a simple everyman's gospel. John was writing the latest of the four gospel accounts to a largely Greek-speaking audience. And they were indoctrinating Greek philosophy. So Logos means in Greek philosophy, and stay with me, I know this might sound like philosophy for some people makes you, your head spin and your eyes roll back in your head. Hopefully that's not happening here with you. But in the Greek philosophy, philosophical terms, logos meant a, like divine first principle, a foundational reason behind all that exists. Uh, so Greek philosophers looked out at the world, looked out at the natural order, the created world, and they saw beauty and harmony and order, and they said there must be a logos behind all of this, that holds it all together, that, that is the reason for the harmony and the order that we see in nature. Make sense? Let me give you an illustration. Uh, my wife and I went on a vacation years ago when our kids were young by the generosity of somebody in, in our church who let us stay in their wonderful condo in Door County. And that was the first time I ever discovered what a Keurig coffee maker was. I'd not heard of them or seen them before. I love, if you know me, I love coffee. and I'm sort of a coffee snob. My wife said, I'm a coffee snob and a pen snob. I like certain pens. Anyway, that's not part of the illustration. But I, I, instant coffee is, ugh, you know, if you're a coffee drinker, instant's not very good. So I thought, oh, it's some new instant maker. It's not going to be any good. But I tried it because I needed coffee one morning, and I was amazed at how good the coffee was. I, have, I, can't, I can't describe to you in the time we have how exciting this was for me. It really was like, this is amazing, this thing. It was like a little stainless steel tree with little <laughs> flavors of coffees all around it. I, I drink all the coffee they had in the whole place, you know. And I said, we have to get one of these. Our anniversary was like a couple weeks later, so guess what we got for ourselves? Well, I got for me, for our anniversary, a Keurig coffee maker. And then we got one in our office not long ago. And we put it up, our, the ultimate Keurig, like the, the souped up, the new version of the Keurig in our office now. And I remember reading the manual. I don't read manuals. I usually throw them out and figure it out as I go. But this particular manual, I was like reading through. Look what this thing can do, right? There's a sense in which the manual was the logos of the Keurig. I know it's a crude analogy, but it's like the, the reason, the purpose, the foundational principle behind, because it'd be weird if you walked in and you saw me using the Keurig coffee maker as a doorstop. That'd be, that, I mean, it would work. You could hold the door open with one, but it wasn't made for that, right? It wasn't created to hold doors open. It was created to make wonderful aromatic coffee like that. It's like a miracle machine. Anyway. So... 
I realize it's not the best analogy, but you, you get where I'm going with this. So the Greeks posed the question. They looked at the order of the universe and they said, what if there's a, what if there's a logos for life? What if there's a reason, a purpose, a first principle, a why for all that exists, including us? What if life itself has a logos? If that's the case, then the way you live well or right in your life on earth is to know what that logos is, that why, and then align your life accordingly. Make sense? That's essentially what philosophy is. What's the reason, and how can I align myself with whatever I think the reason is? Now, the Greeks didn't all agree on what the logos was. You might remember schools of Greek philosophy like the Stoics, Stoicism, Stiff upper lip, accept whatever comes. The logos is unchangeable, uh, impersonal force. Whatever happens, happens. And the way to live rightly is to just take whatever comes. Stoicism. Or on the opposite end of the spectrum, the Epicureans. Epicureans were eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Pleasure seeking, in other words. Seek your own pleasure and enjoyment, and that's the way you align your life with the logos. The why of the universe. Or skeptics. For the skeptics, it was, listen, the way you align your life is to always question everything. My grandfather was sort of an amateur philosopher, and he said to me one time when I was like 12, he said, Jeffrey, consider a man who doubts everything except the fact that he is doubting. <laughs> what? <laughs> I remember like a 12-year-old kid, like, what is wrong? What? And I thought about that for like a year. I don't know what you're talking about, Grandpa. Right? So the, the skeptics thought, just question everything. That's the way you align your life. The point is... They're all trying to observe the world, say there's something behind it that we have to get in touch with and line ourselves up with, and that's how you live your life right. Isn't that essentially what, what human beings are trying to do in all these ways? French atheist philosopher Luc Ferry, uh, L-U-C Ferry, wrote a book called A Brief History of Thought, sort of a philosoph every man's guide to philosophical development. Um, yeah, you know, easy reading at night. If you, if you can't fall asleep, I recommend this book to you. Put you right out. Anyway, he writes this. The logos for the Greeks was the impersonal, harmonious, divine structure of the cosmos. Huh? But to the shock of the Greeks, the Christians come along and they maintain that the logos, in other words, the cosmic first principle, was not the harmonious order of the universe, but a single unique personality, one outstanding individual, namely Jesus Christ. That is so profound. This is an atheist French philosopher who's saying, here's what happened. The Greeks and the even Eastern philosophers saw that there was, a, there was something impersonal, a force, if you will, a reason behind everything that you need to get in touch with intellectually and spiritually. Christians come along and say, yes, yes, there's a logos, there's a reason, there's a why behind it all, but it's not a philosophical system. It's a person. In the beginning was the logos. And the Logos was with God. And the Logos was God. And he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Nothing was made that has been made without the Logos. The Word. This is the life-giving Word. John 1.4, we just read it a few moments ago. He says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, abundantly. John 20.31, our, our theme verse for the whole year. Are these not up there? Perhaps. Oh, there it is. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Greek word for life in all those texts is the three-letter word zo, Z-O-E where we get like zoological study, study of life. Zoe was like the essence, life. Up to this point, both Greek and Eastern philosophers had always viewed the heart of all reality as impersonal. People generally thought, you know, there's multiple gods or no god at all. And to align yourself with it, the Logos, meant living according to this order. But along comes John and these Christians who says, there's a Logos, there's a first principle, there's a reason for your existence. It's not a philosophical system. It's not an impersonal force. It's a person. So if the Logos is not a principle but a person, then the way to align our lives with it, 
right? With the, the way to live right is what? To follow these rules? To know and to love him. That's essentially the Christian message. The way to live your life, the way God designed you to live your life, because remember, in the beginning was God. He created all that exists with a reason, a logos behind it all. And the way to live your life rightly, live it well, is to know him who is behind it all. Not to follow specific rules or subscribe to this philosophical system or to believe certain things. That has its place. But the foundational reason for your existence and mine is to know him. He's the personal word. Remember the first question I asked you? Not the part about Lake Geneva that was just made up. I'm not going there. Don't show up at noon. I won't be there. But the reason you're why for your life, why do you get up tomorrow morning? Why do you go to work? Why are you married? Why? Why? Why behind it all? What's the why? What's your reason? The, the, the foundational assertion of the, of the scriptures, the Christian scriptures is, he is your reason. He is your why. He's the logos behind it all. Living your life right means one thing. It means knowing him. Being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why you were made. That's what you were made for. That's the logos behind you, if you will. You put anything else in that place, it's like using a Keurig for a doorstop. It might work for a while, but it's not what you're made for. You were created for that. It's a tragedy, really. It's incomplete at best. Look at verse 14. John, this won't be on the screen. I, I think I might have given it. I can't remember. John 1, 14. We read this always at Christmas time, but I want you to hear these words. And the word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word, the Logos, became flesh. This is the life-giving personal word. It's not like a, a, an abstract being that exists somewhere in theory. But the personal word. Think about that for just a minute. The ultimate foundational reason for all that exists became flesh. Dwelt among us. If you have your Bible, flip back to John 1, 5 for a minute. John says, The light, that's Jesus, shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Your Bibles might say understood it or comprehended it. The Greek word there is katelaben. It's an interesting word. It has a dual meaning. It, means, it could mean uh, overcome as in defeat, or it could mean overcome as in understand. I would give it, the, a synonym would be our English word master. Right? If I, if I master a subject, I comprehend the subject. But if I master you, well, that's a different thing, right? I, I, you, I've subdued you. I've conquered you. It's weird to say, but you get it where I'm, I'm going with this. So the word means, it's dual meaning. It means both like physically defeat or conquer or uh, comprehend, understand, grasp intellectually. John says the light, the logos, the light of life, the life, the light which is the life of all men shines in the darkness of this world and the darkness has not comprehended, overcome, defeated, understood. Yes, all of that. Here's why this is significant. I think John is showing us that there are essentially two ways to reject Jesus. Some people openly reject him, just dismiss him out of hand. I don't follow him, I don't believe in him, great man, all that, yada, yada, but I don't, I don't, I don't submit myself to him. Others totally misunderstand him. Think they know who he is and what he means, what his life means, but they don't. They miss him completely. Remember the French uh, atheist philosopher Luke Ferry I mentioned a moment ago who had that uh, interesting statement about, probably not, but anyway, in his book, A Brief History of Thought, he, he, he writes this. this. When I read this, this floored me. He says, I find, he talks close to the end of the book, actually, after writing a, a very eloquently about the Christian understanding compared to Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and comparing the major world religions, and really an eloquent guy, uh, he says, I find the Christian proposition infinitely more tempting than Buddhism, than Stoicism, or all the rest. 
except for the fact that I do not believe in it. But were it to be true, I would certainly be a taker. Isn't that amazing? He says, it makes sense, it's beautiful, it's, but I just don't believe it. Right? So there's the open rejection. But there are also some people who think, oh yeah, I know Jesus, I got that. And they totally misunderstand him. They totally miss who he is and what his life means. You know, I think the clear link in John 1 and Genesis 1 roots the meaning of the Logos for us, not just in Greek philosophy. John didn't write this to like change the philosophical world. He, he wrote it so that we would know him. Psalm 33, 6 states, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. Verse 9 repeats, For he spoke and it was done. Psalm 107, verse 20, He sent his word and healed them. God's word accomplishes the purpose for which he sends it. Isaiah 55, 11 says this. There's creative power, life-giving power in the word of God. God has spoken to us and revealed him to, to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the, through the, the prophets and, the, uh, and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, the Word, the Logos, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So if God has spoken to us the Word of life in Jesus, we would do well to pay attention to what he says, don't you think? If a doctor says to you, don't eat high cholesterol, and you do, he doesn't have to fine you or put you in prison, right? Eventually, if you have high blood pressure, hypertension in your family, and he puts you on a diet, and you totally reject that, and the medication, and the diet restrictions, eventually what's going to happen? You're going to pay a physical price for it. It's going to happen to you. You're violating something, a principle. You are unleashing forces of chaos in your life physically. So spiritually speaking, and this is not as significant, it's more significant than your physical life. Spiritually speaking, you put anything else, you live with anything else as the logos, as, the, as your why. And you are unleashing forces of chaos in your life. That are at the very best you could hope for is to have an incomplete, unfulfilled life. At worst, it will be your undoing. Jesus, the judge who came not to bring judgment, right? But to bear judgment. To take what we deserve so the Holy Spirit can come into our lives and reveal all of this to us. I want to return to the question I asked you at the outset. What's your why? Heard a, a pastor speak of it as your white hot Why? Your reason. Tomorrow when you get up and the alarm clock goes off, are you thinking, all right, I got, get, I got this meeting and I got this and at 3 o'clock I got to be sure I'm home by then. I got to pick this up. And I got, is it just a long list of things to do and like rolling a stone up the hill and then at the end, at the end you go to bed, that stone rolls back down because does your to-do list ever end? I just transfer the stuff from one list to the next, you know. I, cross stuff, I write stuff down after I've done it just to cross it off so I feel good about myself every now and then. You ever do that? It's endless. Is that your life? God did not call you to live a life that's just full of a to-do list. Just do this and do this and do this, and then tomorrow, guess what? A whole other list. Now, I'm not saying the list ever goes away, but what's the why behind it? I hope, not just today, but through this series, through your reading of his word, and through our journey, through the story of Jesus together, you come to know that he's your why. Knowing him, being known by him, knowing that the God of the universe made you and loves you and died for you, that's your why. When you get up tomorrow, remember that, alarm clock goes off. You go to work, you go to school, you go to wherever, you go drop kids off, pick kids up, you remember there's a, there's a reason behind, even the mundane, there's a reason behind this. I'm made and I'm known and I'm loved by God. That's the why. Let's pray. Our Father, before the beginning, our God who was there before anything was made, as profound and remote and high and lofty and deep as such matters are, they're also so practical, God. You tell us something about why we're made, our priorities, and how we spend our time. You convict us of our own selfishness and short-sightedness. We thank you, God. 
We thank you that your truth is brought home to us in a gracious and personal way. That you, you don't fall on us and weigh us down with more things we ought to be doing. You want to liberate us and comfort us, renew us, and set us free. God, we confess to you that we're living sometimes for all the wrong things. We're not even considering these questions. And so as we depart this place, Lord Jesus, you who are the one behind it all, we ask you to be our reason, our why. We thank you and we praise you in your name and for your sake and glory. Amen. And go in peace tonight.